and we are live for the Enterprise Month in Review. I got my co-host, Brian Summer. How are we doing? Doing just fine. Glad to have you. Uh, if you're watching, especially on LinkedIn, please comment so I know the commenting system is working. I invited some heavy hitters I haven't talked to in a while. So if you got an invite, that means I missed talking to you. So uh, chime in in the chat. Love to have your insights as we go here. Uh, so Brian are going to do Brian and I are going to do our picks and pans of the month, et cetera. Uh, and then we're going to have special guest Bonnie Tenner to talk about the dark side of HR tech and HR tech services. We figured just in time for the um, HR tech shows, we might as well throw uh, HR vendors under the bus. Just kidding. Um, but it should be fun to look at the real picture of what's going on out there. Brian, we got slides as usual. Uh, thanks to your slide. Uh, wizardry so let's have a look at the agenda here so like usual we're going to start off with what's the buzzword of the month and then we're going to you know drop into immediately yours and mine uh top underrated enterprise stories hey thomas is here good to see you thomas uh bonnie will be here as uh, john just mentioned we'll have a couple of humorous asides to kind of uh, bring the show to a close and of course, we want your comments. So fire them away, uh, fire away in the uh, comments section here, uh, because I know John can't resist interrupting somebody's thought so he can post one of your comments up there for immediate oh, reaction. Yeah, yeah. I, I tell our, I guess it's the only show where you'll be unceremoniously interrupted in the middle of what you're talking about. Uh, I'm not sure if that's uh, great or terrible, but it's what we do. Uh, and speaking of great or terrible, Brian, you surfaced another doozy here. I don't, I'm not sure why the G went down to the next line. We weren't able to troubleshoot that, but tell us about greedflating. Saw that one the other day. It was. Uh, it's not just enough to price your products way beyond the inflation rate, but you got to do it in even great, greedier way, uh, the most greediest way possible, if you're, that is grammatically correct. So I saw this new word, greedflating and greedflation. And uh, I, I know some software vendors have been guilty of that in the past, too, when they would just, for no rhyme or reason, just unilaterally raise, uh, back in the day, license prices and, and maintenance rates. Um, so it's not a new term. I always like uh, the vendors that do that wallet fracking. That's still my the standard, the gold standard in uh, vendor nomenclature You know, to describe that kind of greed. Anyway, that's the right. word for today. Indeed. So let's greedflate our way to investor value, and <laughs> hopefully the customers will come along with us. We'll find out. So, we John, got, I got a buzzword that didn't stick? Well, um, there were a bunch that somebody tried to float out uh, back in, the, I think, yeah, 1955. And so this is for the audience to study over. What do you think they're talking about? In 1955, somebody was coining a term for something that we're using all the time lately. And do you know what that word is? Anybody want to guess? Let's see the uh, let's see the comment box uh, kind of fill up here. Uh, let's see. Um, I don't but know. I, but I love these words. The automata. Uh, maybe neural, neural cybernetics sounds pretty timely. Uh, hypothetical automata, um, neural cybernetics. Well, it turned out those were all synonyms or potential buzzwords that were going to describe what we know today as artificial intelligence. And um, I, I got to say, I think I like artificial intelligence as a better uh, phrase than some of these. If I had to constantly type in applied uh, p uh, epistemology, I'd go nuts trying to type that in correctly. Uh, so. Uh, though, um, though, if we called it non-numerical computing, we could stay a little bit more humble, which might be a good thing. How, however, that wouldn't be fair to the vector uh, databases that drive all of this. Anyhow, enough John, of all that. So, what's your? Let's knock out your top stories to the you know this month. What did all right. what caught your attention? So, um, I tried to pick non a non AI story too, which didn't totally work out. But obviously, the AI bubble was a big, big topic. Um, and, uh, you know, I have kind of mixed feelings because I, I did get some satisfaction out of some of the reality checks that came across as, you know, when you have investment firms questioning some of the hype factor that tells you maybe we're getting into a better conversation about where the value really lies with AI, which is important. Um, but one thing I did want to call attention to, this was, I thought, a pretty balanced 
piece uh, from from Casey Newton here. But in general, I think where where there's a little bit of an interesting question mark is that the there's a lot of AI critics who are kind of saying, oh, the Gen AI is deflating and the bubble is evidence of that. And I think there is a large degree of truth to that on a larger macro scale. But what we need to remember is that doesn't mean that enterprises aren't pushing ahead with a variety of AI-related use cases. And in many cases, it's sort of like a combination of more classical AI, like predictive type stuff, and then also some Gen AI sort of interfaces and intermingling. And it's important to realize that's still happening. One of the best examples of this, uh, if you do a search on Gary Marcus AI bubble on LinkedIn, you'll hear Gary Marcus, who's very convinced that the bubble is going to lead to a bit of a sort of collapse. And of course, that's high stakes expectations for big time investors. But uh, the uh, the host of the event, uh, Ben Gertzel, who's uh, also a big figure, uh, he's with Singularity Net. They had a nice back and forth at the end, and and Ben doesn't think we're in, in that same kind of bubble leading to an AI winter, which is kind of what Gary thinks. And Ben kind of makes the case if you if you go to the end of the video that. There's a bubble in LLM company valuations and Gen AI company valuations, but practical use cases around LLMs, deep neural networks, applied into industry like biology and finance, that stuff he thinks has has legs. And I would tend to agree. Now, there's a difference between ROI and use cases. So the use cases are there, but the ROI might not be there. Anyway, I write a lot about that at Digonomica. I do it every week almost on my hits and misses. So that's kind of a, a story we're tracking. And I picked it because I don't think the press coverage that you typically see is getting into that sort of middle ground of enterprise use cases, which need to be looked at very closely. But I don't necessarily think that's a bubble. It's just the amount of investor money at stake could still cause problems because obviously investors aren't necessarily looking for verti- smart vertical plays. They're looking for big, massive home runs, and that's where the trouble is brewing at the moment. Brian, any quick comments on that? I would say that, uh, well, let's go into your next story, and then we'll, uh, I'll talk. Go. Okay, cool. So this one is actually really not so much about AI, but this, this was more uh, Eric Kimberling and Third Stage applying AI to a bunch of conversations they've had on digital transformation. And, you know, obviously that's one of the things AI is best at in the Gen AI context is summarizing from troves of conversations and data and picking out sort of high points. Uh, AI is good at that. And uh, so there were some interesting takeaways from that in terms of some of the top themes that, that Eric and his team are, are seeing. And actually, I think the thing about that is that these things don't change. Like, uh, the kinds of things that came up are things like outgrowing legacy systems, cultural shifts, managing growing pains, data integration and accessibility, managing consultants and vendors, compliance, human and people challenges. I mean, we could go back 20 years, right? In enterprise software, we'd be having just about the same conversation. I think the only thing arguably that's changed is that the data integration and data quality aspect of that has zoomed more front and center. But otherwise, I think it's just interesting to see that this is the same old stuff, right? We're trying to solve the same problems we always were. Brian, over to you. So a couple of points. One, uh, I saw an interesting stat where somebody said if you had a traditional chat bot in one of your applications, it gives the wrong answer like uh, 31% of the time. If you change it out and put an AI-powered chat bot in there, it only improves the accuracy by five percentage points. That's it. And I think the authors of that that research deal totally missed the point, which is why are we settling for any kind of Q&A kind of capability that provides that many wrong answers? Basically, one in four or more of the answers you're getting from these tools are incorrect, whether there's AI behind it or not. So I think we've got to, we, ha- we still aren't fixing the problem. Second is I'm doing a research project right now and what's interesting this time is a lot of the search stuff that I used to lean on now has, you know, has been enhanced with AI. And the, uh, I, I'm hitting a lot of problems, one of which is some of these tools uh, can't have no concept of reasonableness. 
so they provide answers that are just so far out there, uh, you know, that are, you know, that just beggar the imagination. Like, what was this thing thinking of? And um, anyway, so we're still early stages, I think, on this. And I think the valuation stuff is important to note because if it turns out that broad-based LLMs are so bad with accuracy and hallucinations and other issues, then the value is going to plummet. It's the more maybe very specific kind of tools that you might use on a shop floor that are trained on a much more limited amount of information, but can give you a much higher accuracy. I think that's really, uh, the those would be the ones that should get the higher valuations today, John. Right, right. And that kind of ties into my next story also, but this is a very common theme right now, which is that the the, what the enterprise is doing is kind of going under the radar a little bit sometimes, and it's important to understand that part of it too. And I don't want to sound like an AI optimist, but there's a massive difference between throwing out a, a chat GPT driven chatbot to interface with your customers where we've seen all the ridiculous stories versus some of the stuff enterprises are working on. And you can check it out on YouTube if you want. Look up things like uh, RAG with knowledge graphs where they're basically really refining the scope of what the LLM generates. And that's a different kind of bot interaction. It's not perfect in all cases, but it's totally different. And so that's why we have to have these conversations to have much clearer understanding, which brings me to my final story. And I will um, just quickly do this because Brian, we got to get to yours. Uh, Larry Dignan talks about disruptions coming for enterprise software. It's a really interesting article over at Constellation. I think he's right about a lot of the things that customers are frustrated about. None of none of them are particularly new, but I think there's a lot of disillusionment around cost in particular versus value. Uh, however, I part with Larry a little bit in the sense of the AI is the new, new UI for the reasons I just mentioned. Slapping AI on top of legacy software isn't going to work uh, as far as a user interface is concerned. And so, But I do think Larry makes an important point, which is abstraction layers are important. And the gist of it is that if you're not careful, you're going to get ring ring fenced. <laughs> and ring fencing doesn't just apply to ERP vendors, by the way. It applies to any software that is perceived as non-mission critical and non-strategic. All right, Brian, should we shift quickly to your picks here? Yeah, mine are very different from yours. Um, this first one was a Fast Company article that uh, kind of reminded us that the Peter Principle is still very real and definitely in existence, that com people are often getting promoted still in this day and age to their level of incompetence. And this is so important because engagement, which is a hot button with a lot of HR technologies that they want to solve, a lot of these HR vendors still are playing very coy and not willing to find help their uh, customers find out who the bad managers are. It's the bad managers drive down engagement. They're the ones who drive up attrition and cause a, and cause these companies never to win the war for talent. This is a it's not a long article. It's only a couple of pages long. But um, uh, if you're in HR, I think you really need to read it. And I think you need to hold software vendors' feet to the fire to do a better job of identifying who these managers are and what are you going to do as a company to prevent this going forward? Yeah, and I think we can get into that further with uh, Bonnie here. So we'll continue with that. Yes, because Bonnie's going to tell us about the dark side of HR, whatever that means. So that ought to be interesting in a couple of minutes. This story, tech companies can't find good employees and it's their own fault. Yay. Um, uh, I, this, uh, I put on the sidebar here, um, the experience some people had that, and this was written up in the article about how many interviews they had to go through, how much time elapsed, you know, before they could, you know, get, eventually get a job and, 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 and the process is so screwed up in a lot of companies. It just takes too long, but it also, it grinds through a lot of people. Once upon a time, oh my goodness, probably 15 years ago, one of the major analyst firms was making a run at me, and those clowns called me into their offices in downtown Chicago, not once, not twice, but four times, and you could tell they couldn't even remember anything from any of the previous visits, and I just decided, you know, in the middle of that fourth visit that I might as well just go home. Because these guys don't know what they're doing, and they don't know how to hire, 
And if that's the quality of their management, then it kind of speaks volumes about the quality of the research they're going to do too. Uh, only the most desperate person is willing to work for a company with that kind of bad recruiting process. Anyway, this Brian, is one. Brian, we got Meg Bear in the house. Check it out. Oh, yeah. She's, and Meg, she's, Meg's she's, absolutely right. Meg would probably fire me 10 times over, not because I'm bad ineffectively, but just tough. Uh, but anyway, I, I, I see that, Meg. Okay. Brian, if we have time later in the show, we got to get into your adventures of reapplying to Accenture after decades, because <laughs> that's just that's just beautiful stories. But uh, but yeah, finding bad managers. And by the way, and we can't get into this right now, but one of my big sticking points with with HR vendors is why we aren't using AI to help with that because AI is mm -hmm. actually pretty good at identifying patterns and that yep. would include patterns of misbehavior. Funny how we hear crickets though when I bring that up in press events. Thomas Webernight uh is seeing a lot of bad managers out there too. Sorry Thomas. Uh hope you're getting through okay out there. Uh we're just about to bring uh Bonnie on board. In fact, Thomas in the show notes for this show he said he um he he might be a little afraid of like how dark this could get and I said wait till you see Bonnie's <laughs> slides they're going to scare the bejesus out of you I hope we can live up to that hype there Brian uh and we have one more from you I think so there's another little short one it was just it's reminding us for those of you watching from the United States that uh the retirement of so many boomers is leading to some just record gaps out there. The theme behind all these stories is, base, is, is consistent. Companies are not winning the war for talent. And some of that's self-inflicted. They make stupid decisions. They don't go after the bad bosses, et cetera, et cetera. And some of this is systematic because, or systemic because of the nature of the changes in the workforce. Uh, not my favorite paper here. This was a, um, a Gannett uh, paper story this Sunday, but it does really hit to the point about the problems out there and getting all the help we need. And it looks like Bonnie's jumping in. She just can't resist. She's got to come in right away. We so. do. We do have a Bonnie Tenor sighting. I, I wanted to bring Bonnie on because I think Bonnie's going to get a kick out of the intro slide you made. I don't think Bonnie oh. has <laughs> seen this one yet. So I want to want to get her facial facial reactions but uh bonnie before we do that welcome to the show and do you have any comments on on brian's picks because brian's picks are directly tied to our hr conversation yeah absolutely um well i mean skills is at the forefront along with ai of the hr tech conversation you see it in so many of these presentations and uh you know vendor analyst meetings so um i, I think it's Everybody understands that skills and and finding out, um, you know, who's promotable within an organization is um, is important. But uh, we still haven't figured out um, the exact equation on how to find and and promote good managers. So, indeed. So, are you ready for your slide reveal, Bonnie? Oh boy! Okay, bring here, it up. Here is your official intro slide. Check what <laughs> Brian found. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So I Googled you and or duck, duck, go you, whatever it was. And that was the uh, right across the middle of the page that popped up. And some of those were absolutely priceless. And some of them, there's one person on there who I'm pretty sure is not the Bonnie Tinder on our show today. But uh, that's I think what that, might, that one might be like a reaction. To be like, did she really just <laughs> say that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I can't believe well, that. Say that well, again. This is the, the many hairstyles of, of Bonnie Tinder. And and also we got a skating picture out there. Amazing. Is that you, Bonnie, on this on the ice though? It it is. Yes. Nice. nice. I've, I've seen most of these looks at one HR event or another. Uh so I can verify that two, four, probably six or seven of those. I've actually seen that version of Bonnie Tinder somewhere. Um I don't know what the release numbers on each one of those are, but um, make anyway. yes, we have confirmation that this is this is not deep fake action here. This is yeah. really Bonnie on the eyes <laughs> take taking advantage of of that Chicago sensibility. Of getting if, out if, I didn't, if I didn't start Raven Intel, I would have been um, an ice capate. That's my dream. Indeed, mm. indeed. All right, so. 
Uh, we're going to press on, and I'm hoping that those of you in the oh, Meg is definitely impressed. So, uh, well done. <laughs> Meg's not easily impressed, so this this is an accomplishment. And we are going to press into the the meat of this conversation. Obviously, there's some major HR related tech events coming up, so we think this is a pretty timely thing. And also, Brian, uh, you listeners may not know because I don't think Brian, you've written on this exactly on Diginomica, but you also have presentations coming up on the dark side of HR. So it kind of makes sense to kind of connect that to Bonnie's take on the dark side of HR services. So that's what we're going to do. And you commenters in the chat, please tee up your questions as well as we go. So with that, Brian, I'm going to turn this over to you and fire off with Bonnie and get this going for us. Well, first of all, Bonnie, great job on the theme here. I wish we had the sound, the music to go with it. You know, the, you know, that sound that always accompanies Darth Vader popping up on the screen. Uh, but anyway, uh, I've actually done a lot of talks on the dark side of HR. And there have been a couple articles that people wrote based on what I said. And m one of my main points is that with all the new technology that's out there, I think a lot of HR people haven't thought about how others like job seekers and so forth are going to abuse that kind of technology for themselves because it's low cost, it's abundant, and it's creating some knock-on effects that weren't planned or for in most HR processes. So with that, I'll throw in color commentary as we go, and I'm sure John's got a mountain of uh, data points. He'll pop in. But why don't you drive for a minute and tell us uh, what you got on the next slide here? Uh, yeah. Oh, and by the and by the way, just to frame this a little bit, Bonnie has kept to our theme and picked out some top villains. So I think you're going to identify a theme as we go here. So Bonnie, let's go to the the first one here. Yeah, and I want to set a little context here. So as we think about these villains or the dark side of HR, this is really on the services side. And the implementation around these pieces of HR uh, or HCM related technology. And, um, you know, at Raven, we look at voice of customer as it relates to implementation. We gather reviews about the consulting parties that do, or these third parties that SIs, as we call them in the industry, that do these implementations. So these villains are based on really the projects and getting these software uh, live. So I would say the number one villain of uh, projects or project success is this idea of the scope creeper, right? When a project is underbid and, uh, you know, the either the, the, the vendor sales team or the consulting team underbids a project knowing that change orders are going to make up the difference. What ends up here is this you have a, a you know sort of this statement of work that's created early in the process and that sort of defines the timeline and the cost of a project. It is difficult if the discovery process is not done well, um, if there's not time dedicated to it or from the client side, if they aren't asking the the right questions about who does what during the implementation. There is the propensity of this idea of scope creep within uh, a project. So, yeah. So I've been in this this picture you've got. I've been in a in a client when the vendor was up there demonstrating, and I saw them, uh, you know, like kind of put the 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 grip on the neck of the poor uh, procurement officer in the room. And I've seen that happen, but seriously, the, the scope creep deal, what blows me away are there are still a lot of uh, vendors and resellers who won't even bother to show up at the customer. They phone in the, um, uh, the proposal and the proposed price and everything else. They're almost unapologetic that they're going to, you know, bury the poor client in, um, in change orders over time. And I always advise my client, never, ever invite a vendor in, an implementer in, if they're not even willing to show up once to kind of get the lay of the land, talk to the people, understand what's going on in a real, in a real way. And, uh, you know, and, and all of, you know, this, this concept isn't all on, you know, the villain, um, the, the SI who's, who's willfully underscoping the work. 
Uh, I mean, there's Mm -hmm. some cases of that, but more times than not, it is the fact that the client spends so much time comparing system to system, which vendor should I choose, that implementation becomes sort of the afterthought. And so you just figure, oh, okay, well, I'm, you know, I'm just going to get a bid for implementation and they allow you know, a tenth of the time they spent with the evaluation of the software to really scope out the implementation itself. So a lot of, in a lot of cases, it's a rush discovery process that, that, that contributes to this, as well as the fact that many times the vendor salesperson is selling the implementation on behalf of the third party. And that, you know, what ends up happening there is, is the third party comes in to implement and you know, lo and behold, that they find the the salesperson of the software scoped out the project, and you know it's going to end up costing twice as much and the amount of time to implement. So I got two things. One is I don't know where the hell you found that awesome picture of of Darth Vader like lecturing <laughs> on the whiteboard. That's that's brilliant. Um, number two is I think Thomas is is getting in on the point you're trying to make there with a couple of comments, include d- pulling a bit of a contrarian stance on you there. The tip goes too short. The villain pops up mainly because buyers go for the cheap option. Respond. Yeah. Um, And that that's absolutely a factor as well. Um, You get three side by side comparisons. You go with the cheapest option um, because it is the cheapest and um, you end up paying twice as much in the long run um, as if you had gone with the more complete uh, proposal. So a million times, yes. Don't go with the cheapest um, proposal because chances are you'll end up paying for it after after the fact. Right. And doesn't that imply that you would want to bring in on your short list at least one vendor that is not the cheapest, but is promising more of a value transformation, but talks like the language of your industry. So it kind of makes sense, like why you would pay more for a deeper value. Because otherwise, if you don't, bring in someone like that to challenge your view, then it's easy to see how it could become a race to the bottom. Yep. I think you want a broad range of potential partners to come in so you get a complete view and then are able to really look at the big picture. And, you know, it's one of the things that we look at in our reviews is the project scope quality. How many changers did you have? You, what we do is make it easy to look up a partner to see how often are they are they you know running change orders on projects in the voice of the customer from the the the, the customer perspective, um, and that that'll help you answer that question as well. Again, you want a rounded viewpoint of types of partners from you know the uh, cheap and cheerful all the way up to the the most expensive. Hey Bonnie, did you bring up? Did you do, do you have a spare headset? Because I'm getting a little echo on your audio. Are you able to put a headset on? Uh, in my, the meantime, in the mean, closer in is the meantime, well, uh, yeah, let's try that. Say something. How did this work? A little better. Okay. Cool. Better? Um, all right. So let's move on to the next, next slide. Cause that, I think we've really covered the scope creeper. Now we have number two. Yes. So Java, the standard integration. Um, and if we, you know, have one. Uh, thorn that comes up more often than anything else. It is uh, integrations were a real pain point during implementation. Um, so the villain here is is the word standard integration, and um, you know customers thinking that because you know it's presented as a standard integration, that means that oh, it's going to take no time plug and play. I don't need any additional resources to make this thing go. And um, nothing can be further from the truth um, because, you know, integrations are, um, again, that that term needs to be qualified. So what fields? How often? Is it bi-directional? Who's going to support an integration ongoing when, um, you know, the software has an upgrade? Things like that. So the devil is really in the details. And not for customers, you know, not to allow enough time or involve the right technical resources on a project. Um, you know, this becomes a reason that projects um, go long or, you know, are late um, and cost more money than you initially thought they would. So let me jump in. Uh, 
the listeners may not realize this, but Bonnie's company is predominantly focused on HR technology. And what's interesting to me is um, uh, a typical HRMS and payroll package might have, uh, for a large company, uh, more than 100 integrations. When you think about all the benefit providers, the tax table companies, uh, the uh, insurance brokerages, uh, the financial systems they have to connect to, the time and attendance systems, and it just goes on and on and on. And HR systems often are bolted up to a zillion best of breed applications for campus interviewing and a whole bunch of other capabilities. The amount of integration work on an HR project is substantial. And uh, anyone who underestimates that does so at their own um, risk. Anyway, back to you. I don't know who's Jabba on this slide. I hope none of us are, but uh, uh, anyway. Yeah, that, that could get awkward. Let's not talk about that. But, uh, <laughs> but Brian, I did want to add to that comment. One of your uh, notorious, when you bring the heat at events, has to do with payroll integration and the implications for finance, especially as vendors get yeah. excited about continuous close and, you know, a bunch of feel good talk around continuous close. And usually a hand goes up and it's Brian. And usually it's going to be about integrating things like payroll from HR and how difficult that still is to do. Yeah, because it's more than just an integration. It's the creation of accruals, reversals, other kinds of journal entries. And you know, nobody in payroll is going to get payroll right the very first time they get ready to set it up, they're going to have to rerun it because they missed somebody or somebody's time was incorrect or somebody wanted to put in a bonus and it didn't get put in at a time. They want to rerun this stuff. And it's just a mess. So, um, yeah, this, this is a this is a I would agree. This is a big villain. We're not going to solve it on this call, but uh, but just recognize it's there and it, it must it is a force that must be dealt with. I wish we could just put it in carbonite and forget about it for the next 20 years, but that's not going to work. Well, I do have one proposal, if the two of you agree, that we can ban the use of seamless integration, not only from this show, but from all conferences. Hmm. Um, I think it's a, this is a nice one for us to push. Yeah. Uh, we have a good one for number three. I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> uh... Baby Yoda. Oh, no. <laughs> Little Grogu for um, anybody who doesn't watch the... <laughs> but it's so cute. It's so cute and adorable, though. <laughs> this this is also one that we hear a lot about in our reviews, right? So this is the inexperienced consultant that gets assigned to your project after the sales, after you ink a contract. So um, what typically is, is happening um, is one of two things. Number one, you got bait and switched. So your implementation partner presented the A team during the sales process. They brought in the most experienced, eloquent, um, you know, soft shoe group that could talk and wax poetic about the um, wonderful reasons to go with their firm uh, and all the experience they have. And once you do that, lo and behold, the team that shows up is is Baby Yoda, not not Yoda himself. So um, that's that's one thing that'll happen. Or um, the the other thing, and this this happens, and this is not necessarily the fault of uh, firms, is that you waited too long to sign the contract, and the resources that you fell in love with um, during the sales process are now off doing other things. And um, so that is absolutely a, a reason this happens as well. And way to sort of uh, safeguard against the Baby Yoda project manager is to know and get assurance that the assign the consultants that you meet during the sales process are the same ones that are going to be responsible and working on your account, and also be timely with your decision. Don't don't just wait, you know, assuming that you're going to get the same team if you know you push a sign in the contract for two months. I remember some advice, uh, a colleague of mine, he was a couple of years older than I am, and he said that the way he runs successful software projects is he always finds a manager to run it who had experience implementing multiple different kinds of software packages. They didn't have to know that package cold, but they had to know all the things you have to do in the order you do it in. The other thing is he'd supplement it with one or two uh, individuals who had done 
uh, a couple of successful implementations of the specific package that you're looking at. And that's because those kind of people can stop a client dead in their tracks and go, no, you do not want to configure this this way because of these kind of knock on uh, performance problems, or whatever they're going to happen. They could they would save you weeks or months worth of effort by helping steer the project team away from some known problem areas. I thought that was brilliant advice, and it's something I've used many times on other projects. Mm -hmm. We're getting a couple of comments in uh, around um, the uh, clauses and contractual aspects of this. Thomas says, take care of the additional clause. The SI reserves the right to change personnel in the course of the project. And Jason Genovese, hi, Jason, by the way, I know I still owe you a LinkedIn response, so bear with me. Uh, he says, ensure you have some kind of key resources clause defined to your specs. Any comments on the contractual aspect of this? <laughs> I would say it's great to put that in there, but, uh, uh, you know, even the integrator doesn't have control over the careers of individuals. And you should always anticipate there's going to be some... Um, uh, fluidity, I guess, in the staffing. And it's up to you to make sure that you and the uh, integrator have done everything you can to make sure that uh, interruptions and, or disruption will be minimized. To that end, uh, I know one of the things I used to do is bring someone in kind of on spec for a few weeks or whatever, so that if somebody did um, uh, drop out of the project for whatever reason. And we've had them all, uh, uh, you know, they got, uh, uh, somebody got, uh, very, very sick and hospitalized and was just out of commission. Somebody unexpectedly quit somebody, whatever. I mean, you could go on and on. There would be some interesting reasons, but change is going to happen. And the best project leaders manage, uh, with that thought in mind. Yeah, um, I would say the other thing is, is this is something we look at the team change rate or the team churn, we call it. Um, so look up the reviews of that firm to see on their projects how many times the teams have changed on other projects. So ways to fact check, you know, um, sure, it's going to happen. I mean, like these type of things always happen because we're dealing with people. Um, but you can see the track record of a firm based on multiple reviews and how often they're churning out resources. Well, this concept of continuity is critical because a lot of the vendors that use a more virtual way of implementing, like the person that uploaded some aspects of, let's say, your payables uh, content into the system, the next time uh, somebody logs in, Th th that person's not only not there, but nobody remembers or has a record of what configuration settings they put in place because they have so many people involved on the project in very narrow little slivers of time that the continuity is just not there. And I think it's important if you're going to have a team, you have a team, not a bunch of collection of individuals uh, that know what's going on. They're all going to marching to the same drummer and they're going to hit the same objective. Anyway, we need to get on with number four here, I think. We Joe. will. Um, just real quick, I got a comment from Thomas. And also, I wanted to say, hey, Meg Bear, if you're still out there and you want to pop on for a second, about 10 minutes, that'd be great, because I'd love to have you on while I ask Brian about his Accenture job process. But anyhow, um, Thomas says, at the same time, before we vilify SIs, they regularly have a genuine interest in successful implementations. And I would say, uh, Thomas, to that, that um, that... That's one of the more positive changes I see in our industry is around this whole customer success concept. And there's much more of an awareness now than there was, say, 15 years ago that flipping the go live switch is, is not really the end of anything. And there's no handshakes or smiles. And if you have a party, make sure it's subdued because the biggest benefits you need to get are still to come. I'm just about to write about that in the ERP context. Um, if you do a search on Digenomica for my name and customer success, you can see articles I've written on this where I call the buzzword boomerang effect, but because now vendors want to talk about customer success, now we can hold their feet to the fire and say, well, here's what customer success really means, and let's have that conversation. Uh, just real quick on Jason, he says, in the event the project manager must be replaced due to unforeseen circumstances, the firm will provide 
a replacement with equivalent or superior qualifications. So Jason helping us out with our contract negotiations. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, just a little back and forth there in the chat. And now we're going to move on to the final one. Bonnie, you ready for number four? Here we go. Number four villain is the weak stormtrooper, a.k.a. a lack of strong executive sponsorship or a weak team. Um, and this is more directly on the you as the software customer. Um, so some contributing factors in here are executive or people turnover, competing priorities, and politics. But I will tell you, if you don't have a strong executive sponsor for your project, no matter if you get the budget and go ahead to do it, it is likely to fail um, because, you know, these type of, you know, transformation activities um, only are successful if they are, in fact, um, uh, you know, sponsored from the very top down. And, uh, you know, the other aspect I think that we see is challenging is that the team that is assigned to the project internally they have day jobs as well. And if they're not given the bandwidth to really dedicate to um, you know, immersing themselves in this project for whatever duration it is, um, you know, that also is going to lead to a negative outcome because so much is required on the client side um, to make these things go. It's not like you can just magically hand it off to your, uh, your, your, your consulting partner and expect that you know, they're going to magically implement it for you. Um, so again, the right team, both internally and externally, makes uh, all the world of difference. These projects are tech projects, but they're all about the people who make them go. Brian. I, I agree. I would add, uh, I had one project where we went through three project sponsors in about four months, uh, all an unfortunate kind of change of things. And then, uh, automagically, it seemed uh, about two months later, the company sold 40% of the uh, firm off and the project finally uh, kind of collapsed under all of that turmoil. Uh, so, yes, it happens. Uh, the flip side to this, though, is... Uh, if I had to say a number five, I'd piggyback on yours, and that is too many part-time people and not enough full-time people on the project. Um, that would be the corollary rule. Anyway, um, let's get on with the, I want to be mindful of our time. What uh, do we need to, oh, here's, an, oh, Meg, oh, yeah. Meg's back. Oh, Meg, okay. yeah. Meg, I'm going to send you a, a login link in just a sec. Um, just one quick comment, Bonnie. I have a question actually about this one for you. And then we're going to bid Bonnie adieu. And by the way, sorry for the slight echo on Bonnie's mic. That didn't come up during sound check, but life goes on. Um, anyhow, um, Bonnie, my question for you. So strong exec sponsorship makes a lot of sense, but how do you really determine how strong it is? The reason I'm asking is that talk is cheap and a lot of executives say a lot of the right things. I'm not sure that's the same as true sponsorship. Can you comment on sort of how to get the sense of that BS of the saying the right thing versus what's a real sponsorship and real buy-in look like? Yeah. So uh, a real uh, executive sponsor is going to help you break uh, the, you know, break through the, the boundaries or the, the red tape internally. They're going to be there to help speed decision as uh, they need to be made. They're not going to let you know, decisions about, you know, system changes and things like that sit on their desk for two weeks until they get around to it. So they're going to be, um, you know, not actively daily involved, but they're going to be available to make sure the project doesn't stall. And they're going to help break through the internal barriers or resistance to change on your behalf. That is how you know, or you can test, do I really have sponsorship here? Is this person willing to stick their neck out when things get tough? Um, to make sure that this project was the product of the Excellent. Sounds right to me. Bonnie, many thanks. Great to have you. Awesome slides. Likewise. Look forward to seeing you on the ground this fall very soon. May the force be with you. Indeed, and you as well. Thanks, Bonnie. <laughs> Bo your enthusiasm just was amazing there, uh, John. I don't know why so subdued, 
but uh, I like well, I like running want? into what do you okay all right all right all right here, I like running go, into Bonnie go. at all these shows but anyway go ahead uh, okay. how's that is that is that better oh that's um, much better yeah wait I I I don't know man I I don't know I'm looking forward to the middle seat uh in in uh the the old uh can in the sky the old uh, cig cigar box and we got Meg Bear hi Meg how we doing. All right, I think I've hit all the buttons to make the thing work. You can see you got me right yeah, after a workout. This, this is <laughs> this is perfect. Meg, I really wanted you on this show because I really want you to hear real time Brian's adventures with Accenture. Now, for those who don't know, Brian actually had a big time career at Accenture for quite some time. But Brian, you decided to revisit that. Can you tell that story to Meg cuz I just really want to get this going. <laughs> okay, so so yeah, I did about uh, 19 years with Accenture, and uh, I'm one of a rare group of people who actually made partner in world headquarters, which that was like the most political landmine of, or minefield of an area you could ever try and do something like and that. And what year was this, just so that people understand the context? <laughs> It was it was a long time ago in a land far away, um, a, a galaxy, right? To keep yeah. keeping with our theme, yeah, yeah, with the Star Wars theme, yeah. It was somewhere. I remember Lando, uh, Lando, and I were talking about this on the planet Toth or something like that. But anyway, yeah. um, Hoth. There we go, planet Hoth. Uh, so yeah, I did a long career there. Anyway, after a while, you know, I decided I got young kids. I wanted to kind of get off the road show and everything else. Working at World Headquarters was tough. I did, um, I did, uh, I was averaging 50 something international round trips a year, uh, in addition to probably 80 domestics. And I'm sure you did just as bad over at success factors. So anyway, uh, a, f a few months ago, I see this, uh, posting pop up in my inbox and Accenture's looking for someone to be a practice director, which <laughs> I, which I had done many, many times in my career at Accenture. And again, remember I'm equity partner at world headquarters, mind you. And, and amazing enough, it's right here in this uh, Indianapolis suburb that I live in. I mean, this suburb only has maybe 85,000 people in it. So the odds that they're going to find anyone with my background in this town are what? Zero. So I just thought, what the a hell? Perfect, a perfect match, right? That oh, all you, all you have to do is put in your name and you're going to get a call and a job offer like that same day. Yeah. Um, so John knows I have not a lot of love for applicant tracking systems and for recruitment software, but I go to the, you know, because I'm always testing out everybody's HR products and I thought I'm going to do, the, here's another opportunity to try out and see what happens here. So I'm, it turns out uh, they're using one of the major uh, ERP, HRM software products out there. I fill out all the application stuff. I attach my resume. I even took the time to craft a really cogent um, cover letter. And I even ran my resume up against some kind of AI tool just to see what kind of heartburn it's going to have because ATSs always screw up my education. They can't seem to think, they think that I attended like five and six graduate schools of business and never graduated from one of them, even though the resume says, you know, the degrees and dates and everything else. So Brian, how did the interview go? Well, that's the funny thing, John. Three days later, I got a, ah, you see, Brian, we've already filled that position. And I'm thinking to myself, how could they have filled something they just posted? And what got even better was the day I went in onto their website to try and complete the stuff, their website, their recruiting website was down. It was down. I checked every day. It was down for four straight days. So I put it in the day it was eligible. And two days later, I get the, uh, you know, sorry, Charlie, you're, you know, we fell in love with somebody else. Do you know, do you know if AI screened you out or if, uh, <laughs> So I actually tried calling that office because they're just down the street from me. 
I called, I've tried calling over there and I said, I want to talk to somebody in like HR. I want to find out what happened. And all I've gotten is crickets. Uh, so no one's ever responded. No one's ever done anything. And, uh, and, and, but it doesn't matter because they've apparently already hired somebody. And uh, it just goes to show that I think a lot of what's out there uh, from either a tech or corporate process perspective is not either not true or it's just bullshit. It just doesn't work. Um, <laughs> not true to bullshit, the range of... <laughs> Anyhow, uh, Accenture, I guess, doesn't have a lot, not a whole lot of room at the end at Accenture, is there, Brian, for for someone of your caliber and experience? Oh, you know, well. I, I only took a $160 million practice the firm had and grew it to a billion dollars in revenue. I think I know what to do. And yet I could I couldn't even get a friggin' phone call. Uh, you know, I all I got was a a um, major HRMS. Uh, thanks. And was no it an auto? Me. Like you know, was it a self-filled uh, out so, uh, email, or did it seem like they actually gave any personalization to the response? Oh, there was no personalization to it at all. It was all, it was uh, you know, dear blank. Um, while we were very blah blah blah. Unfortunately, we've already filled the blah 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 position. You know, it, it, you know. There, um, it had the warmth and humanity of dead yeah. fish, dead fish bait. I mean, it was <laughs> just touches was your heart. There. Well, I do think there's a message out there for all of those people that have been in transition and are out looking. It's a really good reminder. It's not you, it's them. <laughs> That's, uh, oh. um, and for a broad range, um, you know, I, I have obviously been in the glass glass house of having built multiple ATSs in my lifetime. So I am mindful of all of the complexity, everything from software to process. Um, and ob obviously I've hired people and then after the fact been told, oh, you have to log a, a job opening so that it can be fair. And I was like, well, except for that, I've already hired someone. So you know, so yes, I, I can, I can empathize with all elements of this, but I do think this is another key, key example of the more that we think that automation is going to help us at the expense of our humanity, at the expense of the relationships and the reputation that we are building for our brand, the, the more trouble we're going to keep creating because at the end of the day, you know, setting aside your situation, because I know there was a fair bit of humor and you're not um, like living or dying by whether you get this job. But like there's a lot of people that that this can be completely deflating to their sense of self, to their understanding of their gifts and their understanding of what they're bringing to the workforce. And at the end of the day, the decision had nothing to do with that. And so it's a good reminder that like for those people that are out there. Uh, we understand it's hard and it's it's definitely not a reflection of who you are and what you're capable of. So so just real quick on that, Brian, if I can cut in um, just the the funny the funny humorous joke that I would make is that you still have a lot of time to get ready for their summer internship program. <laughs> but um, but on a on a more on a more <laughs> on a more ser on a more ser on a more serious note, one of the reasons, Brian, that you do this is exactly what Meg is describing is that you want to identify the weaknesses in the system when it comes to things like ageism. And I think one of the hardest things, and Meg is totally right, in this economy right now, you can find yourself at a mid-career point and there's this talk of a fluid workforce and you're totally excluded from that. And what you want to be able to get across is that you're willing to roll up your sleeves and do some different things and if necessary to get back involved. And, and yet they look at this experience and find it perhaps intimidating. I don't know. Or, or they think you're beyond the point where you would fit in comfortably in that way. And I think it's a really, really serious issue. And it's one of the reasons why I get so pissed off when I keep hearing about there's not enough talent, there's not enough talent, perhaps in some very isolated pockets. That's true. But in general, I think it's a failure of imagination, not talent, that is screwing this up for people. I really resent any time somebody makes a decision about what I may or may not be interested in unilaterally with no data input or anything else. They just like look at a resume and decide uh, they're either overqualified or they're uh, they're too old or whatever. They would want to do this or whatever. And 
you know, there's a reason I keep firing stuff off and testing different systems from different companies. It's because I really want to see, is there anyone out there that's willing to do some of the things you talk about, John, either, uh, you know, crack open these biases and sacred cows they have and see, is this stuff really true or not? Um, and to recognize that what people are looking at are patterns and those patterns are deeply flawed. So back to your point, I have in my own past had situations where people um, made assumptions because I was overqualified of whether I would be a good fit for a role. And to your point, at those moments in time, I, I felt very convicted, like I would not have applied for this job and wasted anyone's time. Right. If I wasn't serious about the fact that I would be willing to do this job and I feel like I would do a great work. There are times where you take roles that you're overqualified for because it fits into a moment in your life where that seems to be the right trade off. And the fact that people are so disrespectful to make that assumption on your behalf without any conversation to give you a moment to clarify, yes, I know I'm overqualified and here's the reasons that I'm quite serious about having this conversation. And after the conversation, if you decide that that you don't think I'm a fit, that's great. But if the reason you don't think I'm a fit is because some preconceived idea in your mind of what I would be wanting based on what you want, that doesn't feel authentic. And that, again, it's back to it. Uh, you're not keeping your brand promise well, of your organization. So everyone should know you you ran one of the biggest uh, hr software companies out there so you should know this space one of the things i find fascinating is some of the jobs i would apply for um are based out of austin texas and mm -hmm. why why would i apply for those um if you couldn't tell i'm from texas but i have a ranch right near austin and but the minute they see that the address on my whatever resume or application and nowadays it's Indi indiana they immediately think I am some moron who couldn't read the freaking job description to find out that the job is in Austin. But they don't give you any place in the uh, application process to identify why you might want to be in Austin. You know, and they make again making assumptions. They make assumptions about either you're too stupid to understand this position was in Austin. That's one assumption. The next is. Uh, we don't want to pay to move you down there. And and I never asked for that. And I could go on and on, you know, but they make all these assumptions and none of which are grounded in fact or reality. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Those assumptions are based on them, not on you. And that is the reality. I think that all of us could take a moment and reflect that when we make assumptions on behalf of other people, we are doing what we, we hope we uh, are better than, which is we're putting ourselves to the idea of like, what would I think? Well, that may or may not apply. What you think in that context and where you are in your life, it may not really be the perspective of what somebody else is living at that moment. So it's a good reminder for all of us. Perspective taking is hard and it does differentiate. It differentiates companies. It differentiates leaders. It differentiates hiring managers. And it absolutely differentiates what a workforce is able to do because when we start to respect the fact that I might not know what is motivating you and start actually being open to the conversation of asking you and using it as an opportunity for me to learn. I think that is the place where we're going to start having that, you know, that talent pool that is materially bigger than we thought because we're able to really respect what are people wanting to do and how do we help facilitate that? So uh, we're almost at the end here, but before we wrap, uh, I want to, ask you, Meg, with all these big shows coming up and such, I know you monitor this space. What are the things that you that you kind of are hoping to hear more about this fall? And what are you kind of concerned about, like hearing too much of overhype? Like, where, what are you looking for out of these <laughs> events from as you yeah. go and stuff? So, so again, I know that it's impossible to go to any of these events and not have it be about AI. I think your your reflections earlier in this conversation about okay, great, we want to talk about AI. Let's quit talking about it in abstract and let's start talking about it in, <clears throat> in the context of how it's going to help people. Let's right. start talking about making sure that we care about showing up better for each other, for people, and for business. And I think, again, there's a lot underneath that to unpack. Your point about who are the bad managers, things like that. Again, 
it's really things haven't changed the things that we need to do to to help workforce move forward. We get very stuck in the tech for the sake of the tech and get very removed from the value creation for the people doing work. And so I would really love to see more of the conversations. Everything we want to talk about, it's a the and, you know, we want to talk about skills, but in the context of helping people thrive at work. We want to talk about AI, but in the context of improving the experience at work. We want to talk about all of these pieces, but we need to remember what it is that we're looking to do. It's not for the sake of the technology. It's for the sake of work in general. So that's what I'm looking for. I know I'll be disappointed because I am absolutely um, pushing on purpose to the edges of where we are ready to be. But uh, that's that's kind of how I live. And uh, that's that's what I'm all about. I really like what you said there, because I think a lot of vendors would do so much better if they framed the their vision for the future of work first and then started talking about the technology and how it supports that vision or not, because this is not a neutral technology. Brian Merchant did some really good writing in Wired about how in the gaming and animation industries, people are not only getting fired because of this technology, but it's the pressure of this constant headcount reduction vibe that companies, unethical companies, in my opinion, are placing upon workers rather than this is a tool that's going to help you to to do more creative work and 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 not have to do as much of the BS. So it's all in how you frame this, and and I think that's going to be really interesting to see which vendors get it right. And of course, a lot of them won't, but we can always hope. Brian, final comments on this discussion before we head into our wrap. And Meg, you can join us if you like for our final humorous asides. But Brian, you want to wrap this? Uh, just say to the LinkedIn user. No, the no AT- ATSs aren't reading cover letters. You're wasting your time. If you can't get past the ATS screen, no one's going to see the cover letter. It doesn't help you to use AR or anything else to write a great one. No one's going to read it. No one's going to see it. Okay. So All right. we've we've had some we've been down some dark rabbit holes in this conversation and uh on the dark side. And yet I know there's more we could cover. Uh, I thought in the humorous society, I put a couple of things in here. One was, uh, just so you know, someone wanted to know if uh, they could get me 12 customer conversations. And they're only going every to... Every day. No, every day, Brian. 12 yeah, a well, day. Yeah, but they're only going to spam one to five million people with digital messages. Oh, but those, uh, are, uh, those are opt-in subscribers, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. But anyway... Yeah, well, anyway, I'm passing on this one. I I can't do that to some poor uh, witness your uh, Brian, but inbox. Brian witness your bank balance boom as AI modifies and progressively improves. By the way, that modifies and progressively improves is total bullshit. It's it's obvious that they're just casting a massively wide net as ever before. I'm sure they got my email address in one of those one to five million. Uh, that's how I got this email. Anyway. Let's show well, now everybody in. has it. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Uh, this one was interesting. It's actually two different emails from two different magazines. One of them is I. Th- they want to put me on the cover as being one of the top zero five HR tech experts in um, whatever twenty twenty four. And the other one is a magazine called Mister Business Magazine, and I, they want me to be on the cover of that one as well. Feature story. I, I actually don't mean to burst your bubble, but I think I was asked to be on Mrs. Business Magazine as well. So, hey, just, you oh know. my gosh. Well, wow. I went I went looking at the newsstand for any of these magazines, and they all are must be sold out because I can't find these amazing publications. Yeah, it's kind of weird. You know? I never see those in the airport, like like in the bookshelves, no. like right in front. I never really no. see those. It's kind of strange. Um, but but anyway, congratulations on that honor, that recognition, uh, Brian. I'm, um, you know, to be one of the top zero five, uh, you know, that, you know, that just really, really touched me. It it got me right here. Uh, but anyway. Well, looking forward to the feature. Maybe that'll be one of my picks next month. Well, I don't think we've got anything more to throw at the audience today uh, for creating value. We've uh, beat up on AI. We beat up on HR. We beat up on HR tech. I'd say it was a good. Uh, I think uh, it was a good uh, podcast. Let's we'll, we'll see if let's see if Meg can bring it home. Then, Meg, what what inspires you and creates value in your world? So you know, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about opportunity in general, like 
how opportunity and, and work can be in the future. And so while I'm still in the I'm making it up in my own mind about uh, where the future will go, I do get very deeply inspired to know that we are learning a lot more about each other and we're digitizing a lot more things. And I think that creates an opportunity for us to really differentiate better um, and hopefully get a much more individualized perspective on how we are going to grow and, and thrive in this sort of crazy future. So I'm both optimistic and, you know, terrified about how we how we're going to see things change. And I'm really believe that the future we know for sure the future looks very different than it does today. And so I think it's on us to keep pushing it in the right direction. Thomas, I'm not looking for double not five. I'm going to be 007. That's what I want to be. <laughs> By the way, Brian, I, you might have missed it earlier, but but um, Bonnie um, was saying that uh, if you get screened out, no one stands a chance. But but Thomas saw a positive light. He he sees that now he thinks he actually does have a chance to get Glass hired. Glass half full, so, baby. <laughs> so yeah, um, I, I can't really top Meg's words of inspiration, but I will say that... Um, that it's great to have folks like Bonnie and then Meg crash the show because I think that really curbs the grouch factor for you and me, Brian, when we get And only for you too would I folks. show up would I show up after the gym with uh with no hair or makeup done. So much appreciated. Much appreciated. Yeah, you somehow still class the place up. How how did you do that? I don't I don't know, but but thanks, Meg, for joining us. It was great to get your f- views on this right before the heart of this event season. So thanks for that. It was a blast having you on. So fun. All right. So we'll do this again in a month. I'm sure we'll have a whole lot uh, to share about our various exploits on the road. So enjoy. Catch Mm -hmm. y'all later. Thanks for joining. Thanks for all the great comments. Thanks, everybody. Great call.